There are many among us who in the past closed their eyes to events abroad because they believed that what was taking place in Europe was none of our business. That we could maintain our physical safety by retiring within our continental boundaries. To those who would not admit the possibility of the approaching storm, the past weeks have meant the shattering of many illusions. With a third of Europe now under Nazi control, America still sits on the sidelines. Many believe the war to be Europe's problem. Recalling the horrors of World War I, the majority of Americans don't want to get involved in another European war. President Franklin Roosevelt attempts to convince them otherwise. On September 16, 1940, Roosevelt signs the Selective Training and Service Act, the first peacetime draft in American history. All able-bodied men between 21 and 30 must register for military service. Though Congress approves the bill, it is careful to call it a national defense measure. The draftees may only be sent to defend American-held territories. Two years ago, the United States had the 17th largest army in the world smaller than tiny Romania's. And almost two-thirds of American recruits have never fired a rifle. By the summer of 1941, Hitler is ready to launch his forces further east. In June, his armies invade the Soviet Union. By September, they have captured over 1.4 million Soviet troops. In November, Germany, Japan, and Italy renew their military alliance. All agreed to safeguard their common interests. The Axis powers are ready to carve up the world. Four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. It is the first and only time Hitler actually declares war on another nation. Across the U.S., panic spreads as Americans realize they have enemies off both coasts. Surging above the fear is a wave of patriotism and outrage. Within 30 days of the attack, over 134,000 young men enlist for service, ready to take the fight to the enemy. The wars in Europe and Asia now merge into a single gigantic world war, the largest war in history. Short little bit there from History Channel, of course, originally, uh, of course, about how the United States got in the war. And of course, all the situation, of course, in Europe as well. So, hey, welcome you back, of course, History 1123. Uh, this is the uh, first seven weeks class, of course, at BRCC. So everybody's having a great week. I know we're kind of coming off of a Mardi Gras holiday uh, and all that. Uh, I know we're kind of going into the stretch here. This is, I guess, going into like the seventh week, of course, uh, for the seven weeks class. And, of course, uh, we got the finals coming up, of course, uh, you know, pretty much next week as well. So anyway, of course, we'll be back. I don't think anybody's uh, watching live right now, but anybody wants to Join me at StreamYard.com. Here's, of course, the link uh, right here 
of course, below uh, as well. Now, we do have a lot of assignments out, of course, that you will know, need to kind of work on, you know, kind of kind of getting kind of bunched up here at the end, I know, because uh, the seven weeks class and all that. But I know we still have the second exam that's still out. You'll need to kind of wrap up on uh, this week, which is due Friday. Uh, and if you haven't turned the second vocab in, you can email that to me as well and turn that in. Uh, but right now, uh, the main assignments you'll need to work on uh, starting this weekend uh, is the book report and the third vocabulary uh, that we have. Uh, the next week, you have the final exam. Uh, and also, I got a final exam bonus quiz I'll talk about later. Uh, that's going to be on the Cold War era. Uh, and final exam is primarily going to be on uh, the topics World War I, uh, the rise of fascism, and also World War II, which, of course, I'll wrap up uh, today. Uh, but you should have a bunch of announcements on Canvas I'll, I'll send out and emails about all the different assignments that are out there. Uh, of course, some students might not have to take the final. Of course, uh, if you have an A plus average, I think 96% or higher uh, grade going into the final, uh, you don't have to take the final, but you still got to turn in all your remaining assignments, uh, vocabulary, and of course, your research paper, book report, of course, overall. Also, if you're doing that veterans project, of course, uh, I have extended a few days. I think it's due, I want to say next Tuesday. Uh, we still have time for that if you're working on that project uh, also as well. So anyway, like I said, I'm going to have one more live lecture I'll have for the semester, which is going to be on the uh, World War II, uh, part two, of course, going into uh, discussing the second half of World War II from 1942 up to 1945. Uh, of course, what happens is the Allies start winning the war around 1942. Tax power start losing, of course. And of course, after the war, you have the Cold War era that comes in, where you have the United States and the Soviet Union, the only world powers that are really left after that. Uh, so that's one of the outcomes, of course, of the war we'll kind of talk about later uh, as well. So if you have any comments or questions about this lecture, you know, uh, you can always leave comments, of course, uh, on channel or questions, or you can also email me if you got a question, of course, about the class. So uh, let me know, you know. Uh, if you have a question about something, uh, more or less. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, like I said, I'm going to, of course, move on uh, to talk about, uh, of course, 1942, which 1942 uh, is considered to be the turning point year in the war. It's when the Allies, they think, start winning the war. Axe power start retreating all throughout the world in Europe and Asia and all that. So the Germans, uh, the Italians, uh, of course, the J Japanese start losing uh, pretty much worldwide. And uh, there's a number of battles which I'll kind of mention about that uh, were kind of important really in strategically causing maybe some of the turning points that happen uh, in the war. Uh, here's a list of them, but the top three they usually put is the Battle of El Alamein. There was actually two of them, the first and second battles, but these are the second one in October 1942. Uh, was really deemed more important, which was part of the North African front at the time, uh, and uh, where Hitler was trying to take over North Africa, and the Allies defeated them there. Uh, then on the Eastern Front, you had the Battle of Stalingrad, which happened uh, late 1942 to early 1943. Uh, that was considered one of the most important battles, really, in the war, where the Soviets defeated the Nazi Germany at Stalingrad, southern Russia, and so that was kind of considered a pivotal battle. And then also the Battle of Midway, uh, which was where the uh, United States Navy defeated the Japanese Navy in the Pacific, in the Pacific conflict between those two in June of 1942. And so that was considered a turning point in the Pacific that really changed everything while the Americans beat Jap Japan later in the war. So kind of talking about all these different events uh, that were kind of going on. Now, of course, I'm going to get into and first talk about of course, uh, the war. Uh, the North African front, that's considered really one of the first conflicts I guess I'll get into in World War II uh, between 1940 and 1943. Heather was in a trying to uh, take control of North Africa, which uh, the Italians had gone to Libya at that point. They weren't faring well against the British. And so Heather had this dream that to, you know, to control the Suez Canal in Egypt, uh, and then maybe have some access to like the oil fields in the east. Uh, and so he sent in this commander you see here named uh, Erwin Rommel, who they later call the Desert Fox. And he had this um, 
corps he put together called the Africa Corps, uh, which was a German Italian mechanized army, which mostly used like trucks and you know tanks and things like that. Uh, and he was called Desert Fox because Obama was considered to be skilled at fighting in the desert, desert warfare. And I think the uh, Allies thought he was one of their best generals. I don't know if that's really true or not. I think there's kind of a debate about that. Who was the best? You know, I think some people think Manstein was really the, von Manstein was the best general that Hitler had. But a lot of people thought Rommel was one of the best. Who people kind of romanticized him a lot, I guess, uh, later and all that. Uh, but um, he was opposed by the British. The British had this general they brought in named Mar uh, Bar Bernard Montgomery. He was known as Monty or something called the Spartan general as well. He's probably the most, one of the most well-known British generals uh, in the war. And he, uh, he controlled what they call the British Eighth Army, which was based in Egypt. And so they would challenge Rommel's forces, Africa Corps, of course, uh, that was pushing towards Egypt uh, from, from Libya. And so that led to the so-called Second Battle of El Alamein, which was like two of these battles. They had one in the summer, which was inconclusive. Uh, but the Second Battle of El Alamein was very important. It took place in October, November of 1942. And so the British, with a combined force that outnumbered, by the way, uh, the Germans, uh, they were strategic in winning this battle. Why was El Alamein important? Uh, it doesn't look like much of a little a small little village or town that was near the Mediterranean Sea, uh, but it was considered important because the fact that it was like a vital railroad junction, uh, which if they would have taken that, they could have then marched towards you know Cairo and taken, I guess, the capital of Egypt. Uh, and so uh, that's why that battle was, was kind of important. And uh, the Germans, they were outnumbered. They were outgunned. Uh, they, had, Of course, the, the British side had more troops. Uh, and eventually, Rommel's forces were decis decisively beaten by the British, and they were forced back into Libya uh, at that point. So El Alamein did not go well uh, for uh, the, the uh, German side. And it, after that, the Germans start retreating in, in North Africa. And eventually, they're going to eventually lose North Africa so it's definitely considered one of the most important battles associated with, with the turning point of the war. Uh, the Americans got involved, too. If you study about uh, North Africa, in, in November 1942, the Americans landed forces uh, in what was uh, French North Africa, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria. Uh, American forces were, by the way, led by Dwight D. Eisenhower, Ike, uh, who later you know, commands a lot of the forces at D-Day. And um, the uh, U.S. would uh, would be involved in retaking Morocco and Algeria, uh, although the Vichy French um, at first fired on them, if you know about this, tried to attack them. Uh, but they realized that the Germans were starting to lose the war, and so they switched to the Allied side. So Operation Torch is really the first instance of where really the Americans uh, come in uh, and get involved. That's going to be important, but Operation Torch was kind of important later because it helped to eventually squeeze Rommel's forces because uh, by 1943, Rommel's forces uh, are surrounded in Tunisia uh, by the you know, Americans and the British. Uh, and so they're eventually forced to surrender their forces there. About 300,000 men were captured eventually. Uh, and um, Rommel escaped, though, escaped back to um, Europe. And I think, I think Hitler has... Uh, Rommel later build uh, the Atlantic Wall to try to prevent uh, the Americans from invading France. Uh, but Rom that was Rom really Rommel's peak, I guess, as a, as a general, was really really in the whole North African campaign, which didn't really work out. Uh, now, the other thing, of course, that happened that was very, very famous, uh, you have, this, like I said, the Battle of Stalingrad, which happened uh, in 1942 uh, to 1943. Uh, Stalingrad, like I said, was the most strategic battle that was really fought in the whole war. I think without Stalingrad, the victory there uh, by the Soviets, I'm not sure what would have happened with World War II. Maybe the Germans would have gone on to win. It's hard to say really about that. Uh, but um, in uh, 1942, Hitler attempted another offensive because, remember, Barbarossa in 1941 uh, had failed. And so he went with this thing called Case Blue. 
uh, which was this massive uh, offensive operation to take control of the southwestern part of Russia, because uh, that area uh, was kind of vital because of the fact that um, Russia had a lot of oil fields there, which, you know, the Germans needed in the war effort. Uh, also, that was where I think the Soviets were more weaker, like around uh, Moscow and Leningrad, they had more forces up north. Uh, and so that's why Hitler concentrated. So I think some people think they he should have tried to take Moscow uh, at this point, but they were pretty entrenched around Moscow. I figure that the idea was to take Stalingrad and then they would sweep around from the rear and take Moscow from the east. It was probably the idea of what they were going to do. Uh, Stalingrad, if you know about it, uh, was a very bloody battle, uh, pretty much just house to house fighting uh, overall. So very close quarters combat with a lot of air raids, because you know, if you know about it, the Germans just bombed Stalingrad into the Stone Ages, you know, just bombing the crap out of it, uh, you know, from the air. Uh, and um, Stalingrad, if you know about it, is considered one of the worst uh, battles in history, like with the most casualties ever. Uh, Stalingrad, I think the number of casualties was somewhere between one to two million, uh, which is the bloodiest battle in, in human history. And it's blood in some of the battles that were uh, in, in World War I, and that's combined casualties on both sides, both the German uh, and the Soviet side uh, in the war. And uh, eventually what happened was the um, the Germans that were in Stalingrad, they'd actually taken the city uh, at that point. But what happened was their, their forces were encircled uh, in the winter of 1942-43. Uh, Operation Uranus, which was this counteroffensive that the Soviets uh, launched against, against the German 6th Army that was mostly there uh, at Stalingrad, their forces got totally surrounded, uh, blocked out, and unable to escape uh, at that point. And so for like two or three months, their forces were, were totally encircled uh, at that point. And uh, eventually the actual general of the sixth, German 6th sixth Army, his name was uh, Frederick Paulus, you see there, he actually surrendered his forces. Uh, about 265,000 men, I think it was, uh, that finally surrendered. And uh, Paulus, by the way, was the only uh, German field marshal uh, to, to actually be, to surrender and be captured uh, in the war. So that was kind of a, a total blow uh, to uh, the Germans and their morale in the war. And after that, Germany began losing the war pretty much on the Eastern Front. So Stalingrad was very important, of course, a battle, of course, in the war. Uh, then in 1943, uh, you had, of course, uh, the... Um, you had you had basically the, the uh, invasion of Italy that followed, uh, and uh, 1943 the Allies invaded uh, Sicily first, which was called Operation Husky. Uh, Churchill had been wanting the Allies to open up another front, and Italy was kind of deemed as the next uh, scenario after North Africa was 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 liberated. And so his idea was to attack up through Italy into Austria and Germany from, I guess, what they thought was the soft underbelly of the Third Reich. Uh, but it proved to be kind of harder than they thought it would be. It took like two years to take back all of Italy. But uh, American British forces were involved in eventually invading Sicily uh, in the summer of 19, 1943. And it forced the Italians and Germans that were on Sicily to retreat back to the mainland uh, to basically you know, go back there. Uh, and uh, this was basically a total just humiliating thing uh, for Benito Mussolini, who was still prime minister uh, of fascist Italy at the time. Uh, and so uh, he was forced to basically step down. He had to resign. You can see there uh, Mussolini. They put him under house arrest at that point. Uh, so he's no longer, like I said, uh, Italy. And so what's going to happen with Italy later? Italy, the Italians are actually going to switch sides. They're going to switch from the Axis side uh, to the Allied side. Uh, and um, so Hitler, Hitler was kind of concerned that, you know, what's going to happen to Mussolini and all that. And so Hitler actually sent some commandos in there uh, under Otto Scorsini. You may have heard of him. who was a famous SS commando. 
uh, and they actually saved Mussolini, uh, the so-called Grand Sasso raid, I think it's called uh, sometimes. And um, what happened was Hitler then took Mussolini and he put him as this puppet ruler uh, in northern Italy, uh, which was called, um, I think it was called the Italian Social Republic from 1943 to 45. He kind of ruled that part of Italy as the war was kind of declining in Italy uh, and all that. But um, he was later killed, though, later uh, at the end of the war. Uh, I think later, if you know about this, Mussolini was eventually shot by partisans uh, at the end of the war. Now, even though um, the Italians had switched to the Allied side, uh, what happened was that Hitler decided he didn't want to abandon Italy uh, because uh, that would enable the Allies then to just attack through Italy into Austria, uh, through you know the Third Reich into Germany. And so the Italian campaign would last from 1943 to 1945, which kind of drag on. And sometimes it was even referred to as the Forgotten War because Everybody's now starting to more focus on like France and trying to liberate that and defeat Germany uh, and all that. And so uh, because of that, the Allies had to bring in all these different people to fight in the war uh, from all over, all over the place, like from Poland and uh, India and other countries that came in uh, and fought. And even America, we had African-American troops that actually fought uh, in Italy uh, against the Germans. Uh, they kind of got a lot of fame out of that. Uh, and also Japanese Americans, uh, the Nisi uh, Japanese or Japanese Americans are called, they fought too uh, as well uh, in, in that campaign. And that's where they kind of got a lot of notoriety you know, from that uh, as well. And uh, the Germans had this general they had, you see there, uh, named Kesselring, Field Marshal Kesselring, who his real name is Albert, Albert Kesselring. Kesselring went back. He had a lot of experience in war, going back to World War I. Uh, fought with Hitler pretty much in 1939, 1940. Fought with Rommel uh, in North Africa. And um, they called him Smiling Albert, you see, from his face, wait, his face is, I guess. But um, Kesselring came with this idea to create defensive positions, uh, using the terrain of Italy. And so he began building all these uh, defensive lines up and down the spine of, of Italy, uh, such as the Winter Line, I think was one of the most famous ones, or the Gustav Line and a few other ones. And that's part of why it took him forever to take Italy. It was, because he was it, it was trying to turn Italy almost like it's like World War One, the kind of you know defensive type battles uh, using the terrain and all that. And... Um, the most famous uh, battles, I think, of the Italian campaign were mostly the battles of Anzio uh, and Monte Cassino. Cassino was Monte Cassino was really the most famous one uh, that happened in 1944, uh, where um, eventually they broke through south of of what is Italy, and from there they were able to take Rome, which Rome eventually fell uh, in June of 1944, and Rome's actually the first actual Axis capital fall uh, in the war. But it'll take them to like May of 1945 to actually drive up into northern Italy. It took them years uh, because Kesselring, you know, and his defenses and all that, I think he was given like some imprisonment after the war, uh, but he was actually one of the most decorated uh, generals uh, that was under Hitler in the war. Oh, uh, yeah, there's the, uh, of course, uh, the, the Mussolini, the Duce, of course, he gets killed, like I said, I tell you, after the war. Partisans later captured him uh, and they shot him right there. So, yeah, he, he gets killed at the end of the war. Now, of course, one of the big things that follows next in World War II in 1944, you then got the Allied invasion of France, occupied France. Uh, which they call it different names. D-Day invasion is the common name they call it, or just D-Day. Operation Overlord, or of course, also what they call the Battle of Normandy, uh, which starts in June of 1944. Uh, of course, the Americans have been planning this for a long time, going back several months, probably to, to 1943. I know Stalin had been kind of antsy about the West opening up a new front because they were taking most of the brunt of the force of the uh, of course, Nazi Germany's, you know, armies in, in like Eastern Europe. 
of him, all that. And um, yeah, of course, it occurred, like I said, in early June of 1944. Uh, the D-Day invasion was majority American forces, almost two-thirds of the American force that fought uh, in, in France uh, were us, of course, on our side, uh, followed by, of course, British put up troops, uh, Canadian, uh, the Free French, of course, uh, also put up force under, under de Gaulle, and then also some Polish forces uh, were also in all free, free Poland forces were also involved in the actual initial invasion. Uh, as well. Uh, Eisenhower, I talked about before, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower, of course, was the main general uh, that commanded the forces. He was the uh, chief of the you know, Allied Command Force, and um, their main invasion would come in Normandy, uh, which would be in northern France. And um, one thing about uh, D-Day that's very, very famous about it, it is considered one of the largest amphibious invasions in history. Look, look at these numbers here. Five, over 5,000 ships were involved uh, in the initial invasion. Around 160-some thousand troops were involved in the actual invasion itself. Then it, they eventually get more force, like one of the two million men would eventually invade later uh, into France. Now, over 11,000 aircraft were also used. So pretty much the Luftwaffe wasn't really anything by 1944. Uh, et cetera. And um, one thing about the invasion, uh, about it, um, kind of, I'll kind of get to like the actual actual invasion itself right there, but um, there's that little thing I want to show right here about Andrew Higgins. I think they say without Andrew Higgins, it's quite possible that the invasion, the amphibious invasion of, of of Normandy would not have been possible. Uh, you know about this. Uh, Higgins, who, by the way, was from New Orleans, Louisiana, he helped develop a lot of the landing craft that were actually used uh, in a lot of these amphibious invasions, not just in, like, say, in Europe, but also in, like, the Pacific, Pacific as well, like against the Japanese. And a lot of these landing crafts were originally used uh, for, like, the swamps of, you know, South Louisiana, et cetera, and so he realized that they could use these kind of boats, you know, for, for warfare. And so they were later known as the Higgins boats. Uh, and I think Hitler said that part of why the Allies won World War II was because of Andrew Higgins. Uh, he, he, I think it was Hitler that, that called Higgins the new Noah uh, and all that. And so the name, the name stuck and all that. And so that's why, why Higgins is pretty, pretty important uh, overall. Now, like I said, they would have this invasion, of course, that would come in. And um, here's kind of the landings, of course, that they would have uh, at the Normandy beaches. Uh, one thing I did want to mention uh, about Operation uh, Overlord, uh, which is pretty important, they did have this thing called Operation Bodyguard, uh, where the Allies deceived the Germans on the actual location of where the D-Day invasion was going to be. Uh, they fooled it. They thought it was going to be at Calais. Uh, it was really at Normandy. The Germans would have known where it was. They probably would have driven them back in the sea, and that would have changed the course of the whole war uh, right there. Uh, and it included this thing called Quicksilver. They called Operation Quicksilver, where they had these fake uh, invasion armies that they put like at Calais, as an example, uh, where there was one that the Americans created that was called the First U.S. Army Group, or so they call it FUSAG for short. And it was led by Patton, George S. Patton, the old blood guts, a famous general of the American side. And so the Germans really thought it was a real army and all that. And they had all kinds of bogus invasion plots. They had one called uh, Fortitude North, uh, was a fake invasion of Norway. Operation Zeppelin was another one, was a fake invasion of Southern Europe. Uh, so they tried to make all these fake invasion routes. You know, uh, That would, would fool the Germans about where the Allies were going to come ashore, uh, and they, they fell for it mostly. Uh, although Omaha Beach, uh, you study about it, was really the bloodiest of the different landings, uh, where I think we lost a couple, couple thousand men uh, on the first day. Uh, but you can see uh, the Americans landed at Utah, Omaha Beaches, you can see, and then Britain landed at Golden Sword Beaches, and then the Canadians came ashore 
at Juneau Beach. So those are all the different landing beaches that they came ashore at in the beginning. They start pushing in uh, to, of course, uh, and um, there's another picture of the LCPP, of course, landing craft, of course, that I talked about uh, that um, that Andrew Higgins developed. That's very famous. Uh, now, the Battle of Normandy, that was really considered to be the most strategic battle, really, uh, at the beginning of the invasion, Operation Overlord. Uh, and it's called different names. I have the Battle of Faley's Pocket uh, was considered one of the most strategic battles uh, associated with really World War II uh, on the Western Front. Uh, and um, the Allies were able to at one point capture a lot of the cities like the city of Cain, uh, city of Cherbourg. Uh, and uh, what happened was Hitler's forces tried to counterattack them in the, in the West, uh, but it was too late and they were almost encircled uh, by the Allied forces. Uh, but some were, were, were able to escape. Uh, I think half his force were wiped out at that point, but it forced Hitler to evacuate Paris and move back towards like Belgium and Germany. And so very quickly, the Allies retreated. Uh, it's one of the things that happened with that because of that. And Paris, Paris would fall uh, by August 24th. So that's, that's, why, that's why that, you know, the Battle of Normandy is kind of important in D-Day because of the fact that they're able to liberate Paris uh, by August of 1944. Now, they also got Operation Valkyrie, you may have heard about, uh, which happened in the war. And um, in the uh, German army, the Wehrmacht, there was a, this conspiracy to assassinate Hitler, like kill him off. And I think they were kind of concerned that Hitler had taken control of the war too much and they were losing the war. And so they felt like um, if they could just kind of get him out the way, uh, they could take control of the war. And maybe they could su survive or maybe win the war uh, at the end. Uh, and it involved this man named um, Klaus von Stauffenberg, uh, who was a colonel in the Wehrmacht, German army. And uh, he conspired to eventually try to assassinate Hitler and create some kind of coup that would overthrow Hitler. Well, and then after that, it was kind of a debate about what was going to happen after that. They're not sure if they were going to end the Third Reich or what, but maybe they were they were going to try to take control of the war. I know that for sure. And uh, Stauffenberg went to um, what is basically uh, Hitler's headquarters. Well, there's like the meeting room. I guess they met at Rastenburg. Rastenburg was the military headquarters of Hitler in East Prussia. They call it the Wolf's Lair. Uh, and uh, Stauffenberg went, went there for a meeting military meeting with them, and he had this bomb in a briefcase. Uh, and apparently he wasn't able to, to arm, he had like two bombs inside of it, but he wasn't only able to uh, arm one of the two bombs. And when the bomb went off, it destroyed most of the room, you can see there, uh, but it didn't kill Hitler. Uh, and so Hitler was able to survive uh, the assassination attempt on him. And so after that, he crushed the whole um, conspiracy and um, they ended up, like Stauffenberg and others, were eventually killed uh, because of the 20 July plot uh, and all that. And that's usually what they call it in Europe, the 20 July plot. So I don't know what would happen if Hitler would have been killed. That might have, you know, shortened the war uh, and all that. So uh, anyway, um, so you got that going on. There's Stauffenberg. Stauffenberg's now a big hero in Germany now because he stood up to Hitler, even though he was killed. Uh, and all that. And so anybody that, you know, went against the Nazis uh, and all that are now considered big heroes uh, in, in modern Germany anyway. Now, the Third Reich, it starts to collapse by 1944-45, uh, but they have a few more battles that really take place uh, on, on the um, Western Front that are well known that I did want to talk about. They did have this battle that they call the Battle of the Bulge, which took place uh, between December 1944 and January 1945, uh, where the Americans fought a really bloody battle against the uh, Nazi Nazis, their, their armies. Uh, and um, you study about this, Heather did a surprise winter offensive, which the Germans hadn't done a winter offensive like this in years. I want to say going back to Frederick the Great, last time they'd done anything like that. 
And so his plan was to attack the uh, Allied forces of the Americans, the British, in the Ardennes Forest, uh, which they had done in 1940. And the idea was to split split their forces in half, and then they were going to drive on Antwerp, which was where the Americans and the British had a lot of their supplies, supplying their forces at that point. And uh, the Germans called it the um, Operation Watch on the Rhine because uh, they were concerned that the Allies were going to cross the Rhine River, and then that would be the pretty much the end of the war. And uh, the counterattack actually drove the Allies back, uh, forming bulges uh, in their lines. You can see the actual, uh, trans you can see how the Allies were able to take back most of France and then drive the German forces back into Belgium. And then right here, you can see where the Ardennes is between like Belgium and France, uh, the Germans counterattacked. Uh, and that was a horrible battle because it was fought in the wintertime. And um, they call it bulge because it created this huge bulge in the Allied lines. Uh, and so that's what the, the newspapers started calling it that. Uh, so the name stuck. And uh, there was this one town that they couldn't take, if you know about this, uh, which was called Bastion. Uh, and uh, anyway, some of the American forces, I think under the current 1st Airborne Division, refused to surrender under this uh, general named Anthony McAuliffe. And he told them that they were nuts, uh, that, they want, that they want the Americans to surrender. Uh, and so um, the uh, Germans weren't able to you know, continue their offensive. And it just by January, it just basically collapsed. Uh, and that was the end of basically uh, that. So from there, um, you can see here Nazi Germany uh, by 1945, it gets invaded. Uh, you got the British, the French, the Americans invading from the West. Uh, also, you got Allied forces coming up from Italy. Then the Soviets, the Soviets invade uh, through like uh, Hungary, uh, through, through Poland, uh, into Germany. Uh, and so uh, eventually by, by April, May 1945, uh, eventually, the, the the Soviet forces they take Berlin, uh, battle Brit battle of Berlin, which was really the last major battle that was fought in, in in Europe during the war. And uh, I think May second was the when the when the battle ended when they finally had taken uh, Berlin uh, at that point. And so, pretty much the um, the Germans are going to force a surrender. Uh, they think Hitler killed himself. It's been kind of debated about that, although. Germans claim that he died in battle, uh, fighting with his forces uh, and didn't kill himself. The Allies said he killed himself, so it's kind of a debate about that, how it happened to him. But um, eventually the Germans surrender officially on May 8th, 1945, and that officially you know, ends World War II in Europe. They later call it Victory in Europe Day uh, or VE Day uh, also as well. So... That, that pretty much ends, you know, uh, World War II uh, overall, you know. Now, I'm going to move on. I've got a you know, few minutes today. I'm going to kind of talk just briefly also what occurs. Uh, they have the Pacific War uh, as well that they fight. Uh, so I'm kind of talking about that for a few minutes because the United States is going to have to take on Japan as well and take back territory uh, that the Japanese uh, have taken as well. And... Um, yeah, Pacific War, Pacific Campaign, it's called different names, uh, took place between 1941 uh, to 1945. Uh, and, uh, you know, what happened was after the United States was humiliated at Pearl Harbor, we had to reverse it, you know, push back the Japanese Empire, which was trying to take over the Pacific at that point uh, after, after December 7th. Uh, and so that led to the United States having to fight a two-front war fighting in Europe and also fighting, of course, in the Pacific uh, as well. Uh, and um, that's what they call it, the War in the Pacific or Pacific War, I think is the common common different names that they usually call it. Uh, but um, one of the big things that they talk about that's important strategic-wise anyway uh, with the war is the Battle of Midway. Midway, uh, if you study about that battle, uh, was really the most strategic turning point battle really 
of World War II. And I think we wouldn't have defeated the Japanese at that battle. That would have probably changed the whole war. I mean, maybe the Japanese would have taken Hawaii maybe the next step, but you know. And um, the Japanese actually had more naval force than we did, like more aircraft carriers uh, on top of that. But they always talk about the Battle of Midway being kind of a miracle on uh, the fact that we were able to somehow take out several of their actual aircraft carriers. And the um, United States actually sank four Japanese aircraft carriers uh, at, at Midway. Uh, so that was definitely considered a decisive victory uh, in the war. And uh, in fact, the uh, United States Navy sank four of the actual six aircraft carriers that, that had attacked Pearl Harbor uh, on December 7, 1941. Kaga, Agagi, Soryu, and Hiryu uh, were all sank, sunk in the battle. And uh, the Japanese, uh, that was something that they never really recovered from in the war. Uh, they, they lost a lot of really good pilots uh, that had been used at Pearl Harbor and also lost a lot of ships that were sunk in the battle. And so it, they never really recovered really from that actual uh, aspect of the war. So they couldn't keep up with our industries, building you know, ships and planes and things like that, of course, later. Uh, we did lose one ship, I know, of course, at Midway. USS Yorktown, of course, was damaged and sank, of course, uh, later. Uh, but we, we sank four of theirs for one of ours, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, from there, the United States, then what we did was we uh, came up with this strategy called island hopping or leapfrogging, where uh, the U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps, and the Army uh, kind of hopped across you know, the Pacific Ocean, taking back territory that the Japanese had taken uh, in the Pacific and uh, there were different ideas about what they wanted to do. Uh, if you know about it, Chester Nimitz was the head of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific, and his 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 idea uh, was to attack through the Central Pacific and hopefully take the Mariana Islands and then use that to attack Japan from the air and then maybe invade it. Was the was the plan that they they wanted to do? Uh, you know, the Navy. Uh, and then again, Douglas MacArthur, who was head of the U.S. Army. Uh, forces in the uh, Pacific, he wanted to attack the Southern Pacific and take back the Philipp Philippines because uh, he had been humiliated, uh, if you know about that, at the beginning of the war where he was forced to give up the Philippines, and so he wanted it back. Uh, and so that was that was the other uh, variation of, but basically it was kind of a combination of both those that you see that really, you know, take back, you know, the Pacific over time, which takes several years, not a way for them to do that. Uh, if you study about the beginning of the war in the Pacific, uh, the primary battle that was really important uh, was the Solomon Islands, which were, by the way, very close to Australia and New Guinea. Uh, and uh, that led to the Battle of Guadalcanal, which happened in 1942-43, which lasted like five, six months. Uh, and uh, the Americans went in there to drive out the Japanese because the Japanese were kind of trying to use the Solomons to maybe even take over Australia, take over New Guinea, which they were trying to get into at that point uh, as a whole. And Guadalcanal was a really tough battle. It's considered, by the way, one of the first major U.S. Marine Corps battles really that was fought uh, in World War II. It's like jungle fighting uh, pretty much. But uh, the American side were able to overwhelm the Japanese. And we, those that Japanese that stayed there, we killed most of them uh, overall. But Guadalcanal was considered to be Really our first offensive type battle uh, in the Pacific, uh, which changed changed also the tide uh, as well uh, in the war. Uh, if you go back to that map uh, I was showing you uh, a second ago, uh, which I think is right here, uh, they took back other islands too. Like you don't really talk about it as much, but the Gilbert Islands were also taken back. Uh, you may have heard of the Battle of Tarawa. That was the biggest probably battle uh, that was fought in the Pacific. Uh, from there. And then from Tarawa, they then pushed westward uh, to the Mariana Islands, uh, which are pretty, pretty important. I think those were really considered in the end uh, the most strategic islands that the Americans retook uh, in the war. And that led to like the battles of like Guam, 
uh, 10 yen in Sa Saipan uh, that took place uh, in, in 1944, Operation Forager, uh, they sometimes called it. And uh, the reason why uh, it was important because they started after that using, you know, the Mariana Islands as air bases where they could bomb Japan from the air. And uh, later they even dropped atomic bombs on Japan, of course, from 10 yen, uh, which I'll get to later. So anyway, kind of kind of talking about, you know, Pacific War uh, and all that. Uh, there's, there's a kind of another image of the landing on, of course, on Guadalcanal uh, that, of course, which had a lot of naval battles, which weren't that good for us either. I think we had a bunch of uh, naval, the, I think the naval battle of Savo Island was one of the bloodiest naval battles that took place at that time uh, for us uh, as well. Uh, later in 1944, uh, the Americans retook the Philippines, something that uh, MacArthur had been wanting to do since going back to 1941-42. Uh, uh, that's actually a stage picture, I think, of, of, of MacArthur coming ashore, I think, in 1944. Uh, Philippines is a blood, pretty bloody battle, but uh, they do have that famous battle called the Battle of Leyte Gulf, uh, which took place in October of 1944. Uh, that was considered one of the most strategic naval battles of the war because uh, it neutralized the Japanese Navy. So after that, really after 1944, the Japanese Navy really wasn't much to it uh, anymore. Uh, the Japanese, by the way, at the end of the war got kind of desperate between 1944 and 45. And if you know about it, they started using these kamikaze suicide planes where they used uh, fighters and bombers to attack American ships that were trying to help, you know, take take back islands uh, in the Pacific. And uh, they were known as kamikaze, which meant uh, in Japanese, divine wind. They thought this would help turn the tide against the Americans uh, in the war. And uh, between 1944-45, the uh, Japanese sank like 34 actual American ships uh, using kamikaze airplanes. Uh, 368 were damaged uh, in, in actually attacks in Maybe close to about 9,000 sailors were actually killed or wounded uh, because of this. So these men were kind of heroic, but like I said, it was a suicide thing. Uh, and really, there's no chance they weren't going to defeat the Americans, but they would just kind of get desperate uh, at that point. Uh, then they had the Battle of Iwo Jima, uh, often called Operation Detachment, which happened in uh, the spring of 1945. Uh, this battle was, by the way, considered one of the most famous battles uh, that was fought, of course, in Marine Corps history, uh, U.S. Marines. And uh, the Marines stormed the island of Iwo Jima, which was, by the way, an island. It's a volcanic island that's east of Japan. Uh, it's in what they call the Bonin Islands. And uh, the Americans were hoping to use this island as like a close support bomber basis where they could basically uh, allow, you know, aircraft to land there uh, in case there's like, they say, a damaged airplane or something like that, they'd be able to, to land there. They weren't going to use that to bomb Japan, but they were kind of just as an emergency landing area. And so the uh, Marines stormed it, and uh, you can see that the uh, Marines took a lot of casualties. Uh, I think it was like something like 26,000 uh, Marines were killed and wounded uh, in the battle. Uh, the Japanese uh, fought, fought almost to the last man. Uh, you can see... Uh, something like 20,000 something soldiers they had, 20,000 died, and about 1,000 were captured, just to kind of give you an idea about the Japanese. Japanese had this code of Bushido. They didn't believe in surrendering. They thought that was dishonorable. They would rather kill themselves, you know, than, than, get, than, than surrender. Uh, you may have heard about the raising, of course, of the American flag on Iwo Jima. That's really considered one of the most famous aspects of the Battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, that picture, by the way, uh, is considered one of the most iconic pictures ever taken uh, in World War II. Uh, and uh, I think it included six U.S. Marines that actually raised that American flag. Only three of the men actually survived the battle afterwards. Three of them were killed in the battle. There was one that was actually Ira Hayes, you may have heard of, who was actually an American Indian who was involved in it. So that's considered one of the most famous things that happened, you know, with Iwo Jima, where they, they uh, raised the flag on Mount Suribachi. 
Uh, they also got the Battle of Okinawa, uh, which took place between April to June of 1945. Uh, the Americans wanted to try to seize Okinawa. It's one of their home islands of Japan. And so uh, they were planning to, after that, to plan some massive amphibious invasion of Japan, uh, which actually had a code name. It was called Operation Downfall. And so uh, the American forces, which involved uh, U.S. Army and also Marines, stormed the island uh, on in April of 1945. And uh, Okinawa was the bloodiest and also the largest amphibious invasion of this whole Pacific War. Uh, you can see uh, the casualties were pretty high. Uh, the Japanese, you know, continued to use kamikaze airplanes uh, to attack us. We had like uh, seven, eight thousand Americans died uh, on on Okinawa uh, in the battle, and uh, the Japanese I think had 120,000 troops. They were involved. Only 10,000 surrendered. So 110,000 fought to the death uh, to kind of get you an idea of how tenacious the Japanese, uh, you know, really were. Now, uh, the thing that happened next, though, they, they, a lot of historians think that the development of the atomic bomb is one of those things that really helped to end the war uh, in the end. Uh, the atomic bomb was part of this project called the Manhattan Project, which uh, the Americans started working on it back in 1943. And it's an idea, by the way, that was the brainchild of actually Albert Einstein, uh, who had talked to uh, Roosevelt about the idea because uh, they said that the Germans were kind of developing an atomic weapon uh, as well. And so the plan was to use this super weapon on Germany, uh, but it ended up getting used on Japan because uh, the war was over in Europe. Um, they had this general that was involved in it. His name was Leslie Groves. Uh, he actually was this uh, ar army general that was part of the Corps of Engineers. And he was an, uh, he was an engineer in general. And uh, he was the one that actually ran the project, which was very secretive. Uh, in the United States. Very few people knew what was actually going on uh, with the project. And uh, it was called Manhattan Project because a lot of the early stages of it were done in uh, Manhattan, uh, in uh, New York, at Columbia University. Uh, but the main headquarters of where the bombs were eventually constructed was at Los Alamos uh, in New Mexico. Uh, Groves, by the way, was famous for building the Pentagon building. I don't know if you know this, where the Department of the defenses in, in Washington. Uh, and so he, he built that building, uh, which I think they say is one of the largest office buildings ever constructed uh, in, in the world. Uh, and so he was also known for that uh, as well. I think it was, he did that originally, and then he, he was put on the Manhattan Project, of course, after that. Uh, of course, uh, Groves hired different scientists uh, to work on the Manhattan Project. The one that's the most famous uh, you see there is J. Robert Oppenheimer. He's the one that actually designed a lot of the atomic bombs. Um, he was actually a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And um, later on, he's considered the so-called father of the atomic bomb because he helped you know, develop it. But later, he kind of regretted it and realized that he had created this monster that could possibly destroy the world, uh, these kind of atomic weapons uh, in general. And eventually they, they do build at least three bombs at that point. They they build like these two you're looking at there, uh, which the smaller one in front, that green one is Little Boy, uh, which was a type of uranium bomb. And then the uh, one that's more, the larger yellow yellow, yellow looking shaping bomb uh, is was called Fat Man, which was a plutonium bomb. And both were fission bombs uh, that uh, I think they were kind of building these at first to drop on Germany, but later they end up you know, dropping it on Japan uh, instead. Uh, they didn't have another bomb before that. They built two, uh, which you're going to know the name of that one. It was called, it had a weird name. It was called the Gadget because uh, they were kind of trying to keep it secretive on what it was they were building. And someone would ask, what are we building? Oh, we're building the Gadget. They wouldn't want anybody to know what was actually being constructed, this super weapon. And... Um, the first atomic bomb was actually uh, tested at Alamogordo, New Mexico on July 16th, 1945. It was part of this experiment they called the Trinity Test. And of course, it was successful, uh, the bomb, 
uh, and they realized they had some kind of new new super weapon that they could possibly help in the war at that point. Uh, eventually, they do, of course, drop atomic bombs, of course, on Japan. Uh, of course, one of the famous, uh, one of the most famous airplanes that really uh, was involved in dropping the first atomic bomb uh, on Japan was the plane called the Enola Gay. It was a B-29, a new type type of uh, type of um, bomber that the Americans built in the war, B-29 Super Fortress. And um, the plane, uh, of course, was piloted by this captain named Paul Tibbets. And, uh, of course, they launched the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Uh, there, of course, is Paul Tibbets with his crew. His crew, by the way, did not know what they were going to do uh, before they, I think, got close to the target uh, and all that. Uh, there's the actual plane, by the way, Enola Gay, uh, which, uh, considered, I think they say that's the most famous airplane uh, ever built uh, in World War II. It was named after um, Paul Tibbetts' mother, who had that name, Enola, I think you called her. Uh, and um, anyway, they dropped the bomb on, of course, Hiroshima. And you can see it created this huge mushroom cloud, which uh, atomic bombs or, or, I guess, hydrogen bombs are kind of known for. Uh, going off at that time. And uh, the bomb actually killed something. They think they say it killed like close to 100,000 people were actually killed in the blast uh, and also the radiation poisoning that came from it. And uh, you can see from these images that it totally wiped out uh, several square miles of Hiroshima. Uh, Hiroshima was the first one of only two cities to ever be atomic bomb, uh, that in Nagasaki of course, was the other one. You can see that most structures, except for large-sized buildings, were totally obliterated uh, by, by the explosion. And you didn't die right there. You died later from all the radiation exposure uh, that you got from it also uh, as well. Uh, they dropped the second bomb, uh, which was called Fat Man. Uh, I told you before, which was dropped on Nagasaki on three days later on August the 9th. It was dropped by this other B-29 named Box Car. Uh, and it, it killed close to 80,000 people. Uh, and um, I think it was a combination of the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan uh, and also uh, the fact that Soviet Union decided to declare war on Japan. Uh, that what eventually happened was the Japanese eventually by mid-August decided to call it quits. Uh, and so uh, they started surrendering to the allies of the Pacific uh, in Asia uh, to like the British and other 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 powers. And so that became known as B VJ Day or Victory Over Japan Day. So it was actually, it should be VJ Day. It's what it should be. And so the, Jap the Japanese, you know, at that point, you know, surrender. Now they won't officially surrender uh, until really – um, what is September, September the 2nd, uh, which they later referred to it as being called the end of the war. Uh, you know, um, Japanese and what is uh, Tokyo Bay eventually, you know, sign actual, you know, uh, surrender terms at that point uh, to end the war. And so, yeah, almost if you look at that date, September 2nd, it's almost like six years to the day uh, that World War II lasts. Well, that's amazing about that. But you'd end up with like something like 50 to 60 million people uh, dying, of course, uh, because of because of what happened with World War II. Uh, and all. So, yeah, the, one of the bloodiest conflicts, of course, uh, in world history ever. Uh, now, they, of course, if you know about the Allies, the Allies discovered after the war that the Germans had committed war atrocities, which, of course, one of the main things that they were behind was the so-called Holocaust, uh, or so it's called the Shoah uh, as well, where Germany had committed mass genocide uh, against the Jews uh, and other peoples, which killed anywhere from 10 to 15 million people uh, in, in Europe. And uh, they think this idea for the so-called final solution to the Jewish question, which the Germans had trying to push around the Third Reich uh, for many years, was something that they came up with at the Wannsee Conference, which was held supposedly in a suburb of Berlin uh, in January of 1942. Uh, and so the uh, 
Germans devised this plan where they were going to try to uh, eliminate the Jews, uh, either through extermination, uh, slave labor, uh, work them to death, uh, those kind of things. And um, but not just Jews. I mean, it included like, you know, they, they killed all kinds of people, the Nazis. They killed people that were a lot of Poles, like some some like three million Polish people uh, were killed uh, by them. Uh, a lot of Soviet citizens died under, under of course, also uh, German rule. Uh, POWs, I forget how many uh, uh, Soviet POWs died in the war, but it was like three to four million, I think, that died uh, under the Germans. Uh, the Roma, you hear the gypsies in Europe, uh, they also killed a lot of them uh, also as well. Political religious dissidents like Catholic priests uh, were murdered. Gays were murdered. Uh, and also, uh, of course, Jews as well were discriminately, of course, singled out the most. Uh, five to six million at the most uh, may have been killed uh, at one point. Uh, it's believed that the Germans eventually developed death camps uh, in mostly Poland, uh, which you can see uh, those are some of the main ones uh, that they developed. Like um, the most famous is Auschwitz, as you may have heard of before, Belsik. Uh, Sobibor, Matadek, uh, Treblinka, uh, Chelmno. I think those are some of the most famous ones. Uh, they were well known. Uh, they had some in Czechoslovakia and also Dachau, of course. And they had a bunch of in, you know, in in Germany. They had the concentration camps uh, as well. But Auschwitz, you know, was considered one of the most famous. Uh, they discovered, of course, after the war. Uh, and so that that's. Part of what led to later uh, after the war, they had the so-called Nuremberg trials uh, that followed in 1945 uh, and 1946, where a lot of Nazis that were in the German leadership uh, were brought to war crimes trials. Uh, and uh, so you had a bunch of men like Hermann Goering, who you see in that far left, he was one of the most famous that was brought up. Uh, on war crimes trials. Uh, you know, Hitler supposedly was dead. Um, Himmler had killed himself uh, also as well. A lot of the top leadership, uh, like Bormann, they couldn't find Bormann. They're not sure what happened to Bormann either. Died at the end of the war or he escaped from Germany. Because uh, some of them escaped. If you know, like Adolf Eichmann was, I think, the most famous Nazi that escaped to South America, like some of the Nazis did uh, and all that. But a lot of them were put on trial. Uh, these are kind of a list here, but Hermann Goering uh, was the most famous uh, that they put on trial. Uh, Karl Dernitz, uh, he was the head of the uh, German Navy. Uh, Rudolf Hess was a deputy Fuhrer uh, under Hitler. Uh, Wilhelm Keitel and Alfred Jodl, those two men were like uh, Hitler's, uh, some of his chief generals that were under him, like the command of the Wehrmacht forces. Uh, jo jo Jochen von Rippentrop was Hitler's foreign minister. Uh, he had been the one that had created that Nazi Soviet pact. Remember that back in 1939? And oh, oh, one of the most famous was Albert Speer. I don't even heard of him. He was he was the only Nazi, I think, at the Nuremberg trials that said something like, I'm sorry about what happened, what the Nazis did. But all of them basically said that we were just doing what they told us to do. Hitler, you know, whatever Hitler said, we just did it, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but some were executed, uh, and then some served prison time, like Spear and all that. But uh, that is one thing about, you know, World War II, of course, all the war crimes trials that, that of course, happened in the war. There's Herman Gehring right there. He actually escaped the gallows. They were going to hang him, uh, but somehow he got some cyanide, uh, and he killed himself instead. Uh, here's the amount of deaths in World War II. Like I said, 50 to 60 million people died. Well, in World War II, uh, Soviet Union had the most deaths. I think there's a debate about how many people were killed uh, in the Soviet Union, but something like 24 million may have died uh, in the war. Uh, close to half of those were soldiers and the other half were civilians. China had the second most deaths in World War II. Most people know that about that one. Uh, I don't forget what the number is on Poland, on um, China, but it's like 10 to 15 million, mostly civilians died. Of course, there. Poland was next because uh, you had like uh, several million Poles and Jews that, that died. Uh, and so they, they lost a lot of people 
Indonesia lost a lot too, you can see as well. And then after that, uh, Germany and Japan on the Axis side, of course, you can see lost uh, forces well. We only lost, like I want to say, I think it's like 400,000 was the amount of uh, men that we lost, of course, in the war of the United States. So we really didn't do as much in the war uh, compared to some of the other powers because we didn't really get involved till later, like by 1942 overall. So uh, there is one thing, of course, I'll be talking about later. Of course, I won't be doing it in a, you know, on a live lecture, but I, do, I will have a recorded lecture later, of course, which is on the Cold War era, which will be next. Uh, and that'll go more into what happens after the war, because, you know, basically after World War II, uh, the only two superpowers left really uh, is the United States and the Soviet Union. So you get this whole thing uh, where this standoff occurs uh, between us and them. And then you get communism spreading into Asia and all that. And so that really creates a lot of tension in the war in the world, which almost causes World War III uh, to break out. Uh, and it's kind of ironic today where you, where you have that Russia-Ukraine thing going on uh, right now. You got to wonder what's going to happen with that. Is that going to cause World War III? Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of situations like that uh, where conflicts have led to that uh, in the past. That's that's quite possible, but hopefully that doesn't come to that. You know, we might be looking at nuclear war. So anyway, um, before I go, though, I want to remind you about assignments that are out there uh, that y'all need to remember about. Uh, don't forget, I think the second exam is still open. So, you know, try to wrap that up this week, uh, get that done. I might extend it a few days, those that are kind of behind on it, uh, but that's something you'll need to work on. Uh, second vocab, if you haven't turned that in, it's due a few days ago, I know uh, you can email that to me. Uh, book report, uh, third vocab, I think are due starting today. Uh, I think pretty much you can start uploading that whenever you want uh, overall. Final exam, uh, final exam bonus quiz, uh, that'll be due next Thursday. So you have time to work on that of course. Uh, but I'll be sending out announcements about these different assignments uh, that are out there uh, overall. Uh, by the way, I think we had some students here. Hey, Diamond, what's going on? Yeah, I hope you had a good Mardi Gras. And of course, Abigail is also there uh, as well. So that's really going to be my last live lecture I'll have uh, for the semester. Like I said, I will have that Cold War lecture later uh, coming next. Of course, that's just going to be for bonus points. So there'll be like a little bonus quiz I'll have on that uh, if you want to earn like I think up to 30 bonus points uh, for that. But that's pretty much it uh, for the first seven weeks class for this history 1123. I hope y'all have a you know great rest of the semester. Uh, but if y'all got a question about something about the class, you can you know email me. I think everybody's pretty much got my email address uh, overall. Maybe I'll see you on campus somewhere <laughs> also as well. So y'all take care. Uh, have have a great weekend coming up and all that and. Try to wrap up those assignments uh, for, for the semester. So y'all take care. I'll see y'all later.